Our RLS is, uh, is one of the most common, most prevalent neurological, both neurological and sleep disorders. So within neurology, it's one of the most prevalent disorders. And uh, with a um, prevalence in adults in Western countries of uh, um, 2 to 3% of the adult population for clinically significant RLS. If you go into the very severe forms, you will get into a 1% or something like that. So it's really, it, it's both one of the most prevalent neurological disorders and at the same time, it's one of the most prevalent sleep disorders. Second, only to obstructive sleep apnea and to insomnia. Um, okay, having said that, uh, the treatment for many years, the treatment of choice for RLS has been based on the administration of dopamine agonists. Uh, there are both in Europe and in the United States three different molecules, uh, three different dopamine agonists uh, approved for, for the disorder. These three uh, different uh, dopamine agonists are all of them very effective over the short term. Uh, extremely effective over the short term and they are relatively they have relatively little toxicity. However, the problem with these agents is that over the long run, over the mid and long run, they lose efficacy. And at some point, they start not only losing efficacy, but also um, causing a iatrogenic worsening of the disorder. This is what we called RLS augmentation. Uh, in other words, the RLS symptoms, the same symptoms that were being treated, get worse as a result, not despite the treatment, as a result of the treatment. Um, and, uh, well the overall severity of the disorder aggravates. And this is a big problem. This is a, a big problem so far because, uh, well, the treatment options are few. The main treatment option in these cases of augmentation has been so far the, administra <clears throat> the administration of opioids with all the consequences that these opioids might, might cause as well, no? Um, well, the... So far, uh, so far what we knew until now. The thing is that treatments for RLS were based on chance. That is, the, since we do not have, until recently, we did not have a good knowledge of the pathophysiology involved in RLS, treatments were based on whatever it works. You try, and if it works, the, and then you make an assumption based on that, you make an assumption on the pathophysiology, not the other way around. And that has been the main problem. Uh, another treatment option were gabapentinoids or alpha-2 delta ligands, like gabapentin and pregabalin. But same thing. Uh, their use didn't imply that we knew anything about the pathophysiology of the disorder. Okay, um, but recent research has shown uh, that it uh, has, uh, has allowed us to obtain some better knowledge on what's going on in RLS. Basically, uh, it can be summarized as the following. Corticostriatal pathways, these are pathways that go from the cortex into the basal ganglia. Uh, and so, uh, these are pathways also that use a neurotransmitter called glutamate are hyperactive. And, um, and that has been shown in animal models of RLS. Uh, the reason for that is, is twofold. I mean, on the one hand, there, the centerpiece of RLS is a brain iron deficit, a brain iron deficiency the storage of iron in the brain is low. And as a result of that, these corticostriatal pathways, um, oh, one of the receptors modulating their activity, which is the adenosine type 1 receptor, 
is down-regulated. And that unleashes the hyperactivity of the entire pathway. Um, adenosine is supposed to be uh, like a break for an excessive glutamatergic function. If that receptor is down-regulated, then the glutamatergic pathway is going to be hyperactive. And that's the beginning, and that's what ultimately leads to symptoms. Um, okay, uh, having said that, um, the, um, that knowledge in the pathophysiology have led, has led to two different types of treatment so far. One of them is the administration of drugs that ultimately increase adenosine, extracellular adenosine. Uh, ideally, we would like to use adenosine type 1 receptor agonists, but these drugs are very cardiotoxic. So what we use is a very old drug that uh, blocks the reuptake of adenosine into the cell, and that's a dipyridamol, a drug that is normally being used uh, as an anti-aggregant. And uh, the use of the drug has shown to, to improve RLS symptoms. Uh, other drugs that, that inhibit glutamatergic function are also, able, are also capable of improving RLS symptoms. One example of that is Parampanel. Um, Okay, so far the knowledge that we had until recently, what we are presenting in this, uh, in this, at this meeting is that a previous treatment with dopaminergic agents, if any given patient has been treated for over more than five years with a dopaminergic treatment, say pramipexol, ropinirol, rotigotin, the likelihood of these patients to respond to either a glutamatergic drug or to an adenosinergic drug is going to be lower. So it's, in, in other words, what you can say is any previous treatment with, dopaminer, with dopaminergics uh, will ultimately reduce future response to any other options. Why is this the case? Uh, well, because the treatment with uh, dopaminergic agents, what it ultimately will do, it will downregulate D2 and D3 receptors. These are all D2, D3 agonists, and they will upregulate the D1 receptor, which is a pro nociceptive receptor. It's a kind of receptor that increases the transmission of pain, and we assume also of any abnormal sensations. So there is an upregulation of the D1 receptor, and that will impair any response to any future treatment. This is the... Um, so, so, I mean, and, and that links very much to new guidelines in the sense that what you need to avoid at all costs is the the administration, the treatment of these patients with dopaminergic agonists. Um, international guidelines have suggested in the, in the past, in the, in, the, in the past years, have suggested that uh, the main treatment strategy for previously untreated RLS would be to spare any dopaminergic treatment to hold them for later, for as late as you can, and not to start right away with them. Uh, again, these are very effective agents, but once you use them, you are going to get into a loophole, and uh, that will make the situation probably worse. And um, American guidelines are currently discussing the possibility of... Um, Topamnergics are very widely used in, in the United States, and the problem of augmentation in the United States it's, is even worse than in Europe because they tend to use higher doses. So American guidelines are thinking of getting into a recommendation by which they would 
uh, propose to to wait with the use of any dopaminergic agents.